welcome to our static code analysis, Is It Worth It? webinar. I am Amir Kirsch, a dev advocate at Incredibuild. And today I have the honor to host one of the most influential C++ dev advocates, um, the person behind the C++ test framework, Catch2, and the composable command line parser, Clara, and a dear friend, Phil Nash. Hi, Phil. I am excited uh, to have you here today. And we're going, going to talk mainly about uh, static code analysis, but not only. And we will do some also some uh, live code examples, which is always fun. Uh, but scary. first thing first, um, yeah, it is scary always to do live coding. <laughs> uh, first thing first thing first, Phil, maybe you would introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks, Simir. So actually, just, just one, not really a correction, but I should update my bio. So while I am the original author of the, the command line parser, Clara, it's been unmaintained for a couple of years and there's a there's a fork that's actually better maintained now um, that I'm forgetting the name of, but I'll uh, I'll make sure when, when we have notes afterwards that I'll put a link into that one. Uh, everything else is true. <laughs> so, except the bit about me being influential, but um, we'll over that. Oh, you are. <laughs> so yeah, I've been a developer advocate for um, nearly six years now, certainly more than five and a half. Um, starting at the JetBrains for, for most of five years. And then last June, I switched over to SonarSource, who, if you don't know, are a, uh, a vendor of static analysis tools. So that, that's why the subject for today. This is not an advert for SonarSource tools. We're, we're aiming for it to be uh, just obviously a discussion about static analysis. Um, the aim is to just encourage you to actually take it, take it seriously, to to try it out to to get the benefit of it whatever tool you use and of course i'd love it if you use sonar source tools at least hear about them and consider it but if you're using any tool at all that's going to be better than most so uh, really that's that's where i'm coming from on that i want to start with conferences um mm -hmm. i want to discuss two upcoming conferences uh first accu for which you are on the program committee if i recall and also uh, almost almost which means yeah so <laughs> that there's it's a bit confusing there's two committees when it comes to the accu the program committee is for the conference i'm not on that committee uh, but then there's a committee for the organization which is behind the conference and i'm on that committee okay so you are part of accu and you are also yeah. part of uh, c++ on c uh, uh, for which i think you are uh, one of the leading organizers yes yeah, so i am the committee when it comes to c++ on c <laughs> yeah yeah um <laughs> Now, ACCU happens uh, early April as a hybrid event, if I uh, know that uh, correctly, right? That's correct. Uh, in person and uh, in Bristol, England, and online. Mm -hmm. And I've listened to your talk uh, on Zen and the art of uh, uh, motorcycle, sorry, uh, Zen and the art of uh, code life cycle maintenance, yes. uh, which was given in uh, the Munich C++ meetup. Uh, mm -hmm. Loved it. And I think you're going to give the same talk in, in uh, Bristol. And I would come to hear you in Bristol uh, in person because I usually like to hear, you know, it, it's not the same thing, uh, getting the recording yeah. and being in person in the room. Um, but maybe you can tell us a bit about this talk. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, before I tell you about the material itself, just about the talk, um, I've given it a few times now. So the last one was Munich uh, Meetup Groups. So I think that's currently the best one. So if you're going to watch a pre... A, existing recording go and watch that one we'll, we'll give you a link for that but um so far i've only given it online so i'm really looking forward to being able to deliver that same material in person at the accu conference and, and you know you're, you're quite right it's a different feel not just for the audience but for the speaker as well speaking uh, live even though i'm going to be presenting basically the same material that you know feedback with the with the audience can actually just change how that comes across yeah Plus, i was i was at minutes, your I was in your uh, lecture at Core CPP at your talk uh, in Tel Aviv, mm -hmm. and I felt exactly what you were saying. That you know, when you are in the room and you feel the atmosphere and the exact you know tone and and um, the way, the vibes yeah. of the speaker. So I, I lived your the the uh, talk there was on I think on uh, error handling. Yes, it was. It was, and in fact, I mean, I, I've given too many talks <laughs> over the last uh, few years. Uh, this is something actually I even bring up in, in this talk. But I, when I was looking back, I noticed you know, a few common themes and they're all clouded around 
this idea of uh, software quality. So I wanted to take a step back and talk about software quality directly as a whole, and in particular at the intersections between the different sub qualities, which will make a lot more sense when you start watching the talk. So it's First of all, we don't really talk enough about software quality in the C++ community, I've noticed. So quite a few people have said to me, great, you know, finally someone's talking about software quality. But I wanted to go even a step further and not just discuss individual qualities, but how they relate to each other as well, the trade-offs. And, and, and this, relates, this relates to static code analysis, I guess. Uh, I'm also yeah. giving a talk at ACCU, which is a bit related to the subject of today. I'm talking about Junior's mistakes. Uh, okay. And some of the examples that we would discuss today come from the talk that I would present also in ACCU. And I also saw that both of us are giving a pre-conference workshop. So it's going to be mm, cool. Yeah. Uh, now, as for C++ for C, uh, I think that call for speakers is still open, right? That's correct, until the, the 6th of February. OK, so, so uh, uh, if you're listening February. and uh, you want to submit something, hurry up, C++ on C, it's a great conference. Uh, till uh, you can submit 6th of February. 6th of February, yes. Yeah. That's good. The conference uh, itself is going to be in, in July uh, in the UK again. And um, again, we're also planning a hybrid conference. So um, in person, but there'll also be a, an online component. Good. Uh, being a dev advocate, you know, we, we both uh, share a joint uh, role title. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you are more, uh, more veteran than I uh, with more uh, experience. As, and, and as a dev advocate to dev advocate, I would, I would love to hear some advice. Uh, first of all, you say that you are for six years already, starting in JetBrains and now in Sonosource. Uh, and, and this job title is a bit new. It wasn't there, I think, no. seven, eight, ten years before. Yeah, well, so there used to be a role, and you'll still hear it sometimes, uh, developer evangelist or technical evangelist. And it's, it's basically the same role, but that title can be a bit off-putting this sort of idea that you're out there to like preach the company values to the to the community. And you know, there is a little bit of that. Obviously you're trying to reach the community, but there's just as much going the other way. As we said earlier, you know, bringing the feedback from the community back to the company, but not just somebody going out and asking questions like doing a survey, anyone could do that. You've actually got to be part of the community, an authentic part of the community. It's not really, it's related to marketing, but it's not a marketing role as such. So it, it can be, a bit tricky to really pin down exactly what it is but basically you know we, we are part of the community we're not just uh intruders into the community <laughs> i think that's yeah. the big difference yeah i must say that i can see that um as in incredible um proposing tools to the community working with the community um especially when we talk about software tools so the relations with the community are very important and, and yeah, eventually, um, I think in software, the idea that tools run the productivity and um, the better programming uh, experience is something important that, in a way, we bring um, to the table. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, l let's go for uh, some, uh, um, you know, before, before live coding, may, maybe we should, you know, speak a bit about what is static code analysis. I think we all know, but um, what are the challenges? Um, how do you see the, um, um, you know, the adoption of static code analysis in C++? Uh, has there been change over the years in that aspect? There, there has been change. Um, funnily enough, I'd say there's, there's been a greater sea change in um, dynamic analysis, so things like the uh, the sanitizers and uh, you know all the, all the those sort of Google tools that come along with um, with uh, Clang mostly, uh, there's been much greater adoption of those in recent years, which is great. Um, just just because that's not currently in my field doesn't mean I, I don't wholeheartedly support the use of those tools as well. But obviously, if you can catch stuff in the code directly before you even run it, then that's a step even better. That's like the difference between testing and using the type system. So, um, yes, yeah, static the, code. The, you mean the, the idea that you can see it in your ID? Yeah, exactly. So as you write the code, it's saying, oh, you, know, you might want to think about that. Well, that's the best time to change it, best time to think about it, you know, as you're writing. Right. Rather than waiting until you, you, you run it and then maybe not even straight away because of the, the different paths that are executing, maybe eventually you'll say, oh, and now you've hit this out of bounds thing. 
that so, if you yeah. could have caught that before, that would have been even better. Isn't it something that we already have for years inside the ID? I mean, I, I remember, you know, for years, mm -hmm. you type something in the ID and the ID says, okay, bad syntax. So what's the yeah. difference? Uh, well, very little, actually. <laughs> that is a form of static analysis. It's just a case of how far you take it and, you know, how much, um, how, how focused you are on it. So you are asking, you know, how much that's changed. And I would say that yeah, it, the community has started to use it more. So more on the dynamic side, but also on the static side, but not enough. Really, if you look at uh, some of the surveys, uh, and I think you had uh, one you were telling me about, and I, I look at the, the JetBrains one, uh, about 30% of developers um, on the answer surveys, which is already slightly self-selecting, do, um, do say that they use a static analysis tool, which may include you know, whatever's bundled with their, their IDE. Uh, so that's a good start. But you know, it could be a lot better. Why not 100%? That that's really what we're asking in this webinar. You know, what's stopping you? Why why wouldn't you use static analysis if it's, if it's just going to save you time and and energy because it's going to catch bugs before they're bugs? Right. I, I must say that in a way, I think that for C++, this is at least my feeling. Uh, Rust has made some change in, in the way we mm -hmm. think like, um, well, yeah, Rust is nice. It can catch things, but we can catch it the same in C++ if you use the right tools. To a point, yes, yeah. Uh, and that's, that really sort of shows that continuum between what the compiler can do and what static analysis tool can do. If you can put more onto the compiler and the language itself, if the language itself gives you more uh, scope to find those errors, so that, that's really a big part of what Rust does, then, then yeah, you're going to get uh, much better results from that. Um, obviously, if, you, if you're consulted the language to, to do that for you, there's going to be some sacrifice there as well. And, you know, a lot of people, you do hear a lot of complaints about Rust that it's, you know, so hard to get it to compile. But once it compiles, it's basically, basically right, uh, which I'm all on board with, but not everybody is. <laughs> so... If you leave it a bit more to the static analysis tools, that there's a bit more you can ignore or, or say, I'm not going to worry about that for now. And in some cases, that, that's fine. Or so, you can, or you can uh, uh, press uh, um, the decide um, mm -hmm. to press it in the tool itself. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's what I mean. So, um, yeah, don't, don't, <laughs> one of the anti patterns is to just leave the screenfuls of, of warnings and rule violations and things, and then it just becomes noisy and you never look at it. So you, you've got to one way or another, if, if, if address the issue or silence it. Now obviously addressing the issue is, is better because then you, if you silence the issue, you may be silencing a real issue. So that's yeah. the, uh, the caveat there, but at least, at least you have that choice. But I would say that in C++ it would be in many cases much easier to address the issue uh, because in, in many cases it's either a real bug or the way you write the code. And um, as long as my experience with Rust is that in some cases it would be quite hard because the model itself obliges you to write in, in a, you know, a certain um, way. Yeah. Um, at least, you know, this is my feeling when I compare Rust to C++. And this is why I think uh, having the right static analysis tools with C++ would, uh, would take us to the safety that uh, mm -hmm. maybe we, have, uh, we can have with Rust, but with the freedom of being able to yeah. express ourselves without, you know, uh, all the noise from the compiler. Yeah, we, we, we can choose how much we want the guardrails to come up. Yeah. So, so let, let's uh, start. Let's play a bit. Um, mm -hmm. I, I read your blog. There is a blog post uh, on modernizing your code with C20. Yes. And in, in which you present how you can use, uh, in this case, uh, Sonar Source um, mm -hmm. to catch. Uh, code that is written in a way that can be modernized, um, become easier to maintain, uh, maybe more efficient, uh, using the tool and, and making it or suggesting another way to write that. And I, I would start with the examples. Can you, uh, you know, share with us a few examples of those? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And, and we really like the, these modernizing um, rules because uh, you, you get a new language and you get all these new features and you think, well, you know, should we go back and rewrite all our code? Well, no, that's not usually the right approach. But if there are specific things that could be better by using a new language feature, having a tool that points those out and says, right, 
here's where you need to focus your attention and often will even tell you do it for you if you ask it to then that's going to make that whole process a lot a lot easier then you're going to get the advantage of that um that new language feature uh, quicker than others so so let's i think that's a great place to, to start yeah i i, I think me, that you um, can share your screen i will just getting myself ready here so yeah. uh, i shall share this now so hopefully you're seeing that i can, I can make that a bit bigger but yeah you know, I that's see. still still all I visible can see that. yeah great so how can you modernize the hello world uh well <laughs> we haven't got there yet <laughs> actually i could i could just get rid of that there we go um <laughs> no so i've left that there because i just want to emphasize this is a, a brand new project i've just created in in c line i'm yeah. going to be using c line not just because i used to work for JetBrains, but just because I think it, it currently has the, the best integration with, um, certainly with the Sonar Lint, that's the, the Sonar Source Linter, uh, and that's already set up, ready to go. Uh, so I haven't done anything else in here yet. We're going to be mostly live coding, and I, I do want to just be transparent about something here. We want to sort of get, get the feel of completely 100% live coding, but of course, you know, we've had to prepare this in advance and go through some examples, but try to sort of leave it a bit loose Give that little bit of danger as well. So I've got some examples prepared on another screen, and I'm going to sometimes copy from there, sometimes copy and paste, and sometimes write it all from scratch. So um, I'm not going to tell you which is which. So okay, here we go. Right. So let's um, let's have a look at one of the uh, the examples that I was wanting to look at. So I think uh, let me find it. I'm, I'm actually just going to I'm going to paste this one in because it's a lot of code here. Let me just uh, fix up some of these things. So as I'm doing that, you can, you can really see there's nothing particularly complex about this. I just need to do that as well. There we go. So we've just got a vector of strings, nothing to it. And we're just taking some iterators. Uh, just ignore the comments for now. That was actually just for, the, for my purposes. Uh, all, all seems perfectly uh, ordinary, but we've got lots of highlighting going on here. So if we uh, if we hover over this one, for example, uh, that's not the best place to hover, that one there. Now you can see this This is actually C-Line uh, presenting these these warnings. And you can see this is actually coming from Clang Tidy. So uh, if you've used C-Line, you'll know that Clang Tidy is, is built in. Um, if you're using another IDE and you're not using Clang Tidy, I will have to ask why not? It's, it's free, simple to set up, and it, it covers a lot of stuff, a lot of basic stuff. Uh, we're going to show how you can go further as well, but yeah, definitely use Clang Tidy as a baseline. There's just no reason not to. And this is telling us to use auto when declaring iterators. It's exactly what you want to do. I mean, since C++ 11, it's over 10 years now. There's no excuse. But you may have plenty of old code lying around like this that spells these iterators out already. So, um, I'm not going to change that just yet because I want to show you something else. If I hover over the next one, you see now Sonalink also chimes in and says, well, I want to change it to auto as well. And Clang Tidy there as well. Why did Sonalink not warn on the first one? Do you, do you know, Amir? I mean, you should do because we did actually talk about this the other day. Yeah, I, I think don't. if I remember correctly, <laughs> I think that in the first line, we are asking for a corn situator and we call begin and not C begin. So uh, the right, right side is returning a non const iterator and we want to um, get it as a const iterator. Exactly, yeah. So, so if we, you know, we, it would be if typical we to change, change it that. to auto, yeah, we actually cha would change the semantics. Exactly, yeah. And, and that might be fine. And, you know, you're probably like me. I'm sure you've done this sort of thing uh, many times if you've been modernizing code by hand. Um, and maybe we didn't even realize we were changing the semantic. It's so easy to overlook. But yeah, Sonalint takes the path of, okay, well, we'll, off, well, we'll suggest that if it's not going to change the semantic. And it's even offering a quick fix to do that for you. And yeah, similar with change, this one. I would just change the first line also to have the C before the begin, to have a C begin. But, you know, yeah. uh, maybe it's the next step. Uh, exactly. And it, it makes you think about it so you can actually take that, that choice consciously. There and then it would be nice actually if we did mention that at the time but um it's uh can't do everything i suppose yeah um and, and the last one similarly it's it's begin but it's only taken an iterator so again as well as 
try a uh, hover, we can do it all with the mouse. But if you prefer the keyboard, again, this is a C line thing. Uh, so, option enter or command enter. So if I see it correctly, it means that you do not only get a, a, a warning or, or a message, you can actually fix through sonar uh, warning um, yes. the issue that sonar is pointing at. Yes, that's right. And, and Clang Tidy and, and C line itself. We'll all yeah. do that as well. They all offer quick fixes. For SonarLint, this is, this is quite new. Um, it's only a, a, just over a month. We've had some quick fixes. We've got 43 now and uh, more going in all the time. So uh, not everything we're going to show today has a quick fix associated with it. Often that's just because we haven't got around to it yet. Okay, so, so this, this, one, the, this was the first example of things that we can do automatically to modernize our code. Um, yeah. Any more examples? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So um as i'm looking over to my other screen i do notice we've got already got some questions in the, the chat do we want to take those yet or yeah we can take a few um so uh gil asks is it possible to have static code analysis running on the cloud server side for example azure devops pipelines and send some detailed report that's an excellent question because there's an excellent answer to that <laughs> Uh, I, I've been showing SonarLint here, but um, the, the Sonar source did two other tools, uh, Sonar Cube and Sonar Cloud, which are both, both do exactly what you're asking for. And in fact, they are really the bread and butter of the company. So SonarLint is completely free, uh, whereas Sonar Cloud is mostly free um, and Sonar Cube is um, mostly paid. It, it gets a bit fuzzy around the details. Um, I'm not doing a sales pitch today, so I'm not going to go into that. But uh, app, you can definitely do that. But the answer is uh, yes. The answer is yes. And um, um, there's additional features, uh, something we call a, a quality gate, where you can actually stop it from accepting pull requests until it passes a certain, it doesn't have to be 100% clean. You, you can specify your acceptance criteria and say, well, if you, it, if you already have a number of warnings being evoked, you can say, don't allow any new ones. Or you can say, don't allow more than this number of new ones, or don't allow the total number to go above a certain uh, threshold. You, you can set your quality gate criteria, uh, and then it will automatically manage that for you at the pull request level. Obviously, you can override it as well, but it's a really excellent way of making sure that, you know, no matter who is contributing to your project, you're keeping it clean all the time, all enforced by a common rule set. Yeah. And uh, Sonar Lint that we're looking at here, uh, built into the IDE, you can can work in something called connected mode. So if you're already using or also using Sonar Cube or Sonar Cloud, they can communicate. And if you say, uh, say on the server, say, I'm not going to fix this issue because I don't believe it's an issue for us, then it will stop warning you in the IDE as well without having to do any sort of code annotations. So yeah, it's a great question because there's, <laughs> um, there's a couple of great tools that, uh, that answer that. Yeah, and uh, I would say that the move to the cloud, the transition of, of the CI pipeline to the cloud is something that uh, I think is shared uh, both by Sonos Source and, and Incredibuild. Um, mm -hmm. Having um, understanding, seeing that uh, the transition of CI pipeline to the cloud is something that most organizations would do um, down yeah. there. Is. So uh, yeah. let's continue to another example of modernizing. Mm -hmm. Let's take uh, one edition, one edition, and then uh, uh, we have many other more examples on other uh, things in C++. Yep, let's um, try and type this one out by hand. So if you have, again, small code that has typed F in, then the modern way, of course, is to use using. Mm -hmm. And again, there's a quick fix for that. That's simple enough. You know, you could probably pick that by, by hand that it doesn't give you that much in this case. But, you know, if you had, uh, if I put that back. It if was it actually, was a pointer uh, to a function, then I guess it uh, right, yeah, let's go has some more value. The example for the pointer to the function, let's jump to that one. I'll copy this one in because it's a bit yeah. fiddly to type. And I would say while you are, uh, copying it in that if it gives some, uh, you know, appetite for the listeners, uh, they can go to the blog post. Uh, I think that we posted mm -hmm. it uh, in the chat uh, and see many yeah. more examples. Uh, now, I, I would say that I guess uh, we, were, we are not encouraging people to go to their code and start modernizing the code 
this is not the proper approach. Uh, listen to the Zen on how to do that. But if you are, you are in a certain class that you are maintaining already, uh, if you are in the file and you need new code in this uh, function or in this class, this is the right time to refactor and to have code that you can better maintain. Yeah, actually, I have two asides on that, uh, which I'll try to quickly get through. One is that a few years ago, when I was working on the, the catch code base before it became catch2, at the time, catch itself was C++ 98, and we were holding it back to C++ 98 because there's still so many people using it. And at some point, I think it was quite late, like um, maybe 2017, 2018, not that long ago, we said, right, okay, now's the time we can we can fork this, um, make the main branch C++ 11. It's still, still C++ 11. Uh, and that's when we renamed it Catch 2. Because that was like the main reason for moving to, to Catch 2, we, we did go back over the whole code base and look for every opportunity we could find to modernize it. And yeah. we didn't use static analysis tools at the time, so it was all done by hand. Um, it was uh, just, did, did you, just small did you, enough that was while doing work. that while doing that did you use any um testing framework to test your code it's a very good question <laughs> it's a recursive Cat, question yeah and catch does test itself but that's a it's whole a other track. story it's a we're, we're, getting, we're getting off track but um yeah. i've done some talks on that <laughs> but yes catch tests itself as well yeah so um, so good, let's good go to uh, another um you know a, a different uh set of examples but let me just quickly um, finish this one because I wanted yeah, to yeah, show you the sorry. quick text. Yeah, I, so, I, I thought that we yeah. did that. Sorry. Yep. Yeah, no, um, much more readable. And not only that, it's actually quite fiddly to unpick yourself. If, you, if you're not comfortable with working with um, function pointers in the first place, then trying to translate it into a, a using statement itself is quite tricky. So having the tool do it for you pretty reliably. You know, you never one hundred, never one hundred percent rely on these tools. Always verify yourself, test, and um, and so on. But um, usually, these are pretty reliable. So, especially this this particular one. So, much safer than doing it by hand, I think. Anyway, sorry. I, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Uh, recently, I posted a blog post on uh, vector pitfalls, uh, which not only beginners fall at, uh, fall in. And I think we can post in the chat the link to the Vector Pitfalls uh, blog post. Mm -hmm. uh, and then maybe we can take a few examples from there because I discussed it with someone uh, and he said, you know what? These are all our pitfalls uh, that, yeah, we should avoid, but uh, it might be that static code analysis tools can catch some of them. So let's check that. Okay. So. Let's let's see. I think that uh, my more my admin here is uh, posting it into the chat, uh, and um, yeah, we have it. Uh, uh, no, it's not this no, one. It's not the one. It's not the right one. It, it's another uh, interesting one. But I'm uh, looking for the ten mistakes to avoid when using SCD std vector. And I think this is the right that one. That's promising. Yeah. So let me switch my screen to that briefly. Uh, and what we would check there are a few yeah. mistakes, a few quite basic mistakes in, in, in some cases, and, and to see um, if, uh, yeah, you are presenting now the blog post. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you we, know, randomly we can just that. select uh, something that we think is interesting. Uh, we have cases where we use size and then we um, do not use the elements that were created with the size and we just override them, which is inefficiency. It is, yes. Um, and you, you could argue that it's not particularly inefficient in this case, but um, it, more generally it could be, I agree. Yeah, so um, we can take this example. Or we, uh, there are a few. So uh, you, we can scroll and, you know, just... Uh, oh. Just, just looking at this example for a moment. So, um, I mean, I you shared this with me the other day, and I did try them out. And and actually, Sona Lint doesn't warn on, on most of these. But in many cases, there's good reasons to. In this one in particular, there's a bigger problem in that um, if you were going to do this using uh, a different approach, maybe it's not this one. I may be thinking ahead. 
I think this one is genuinely we, we should probably warn on that. So yeah, it uh, is inefficiency. It's not a bug. Uh, hmm. So yeah, uh, maybe inefficiency is something that uh, uh, is is not the first in line. Um, but you know, let's let's yeah. uh, um, scroll it over to uh, the the next one is is uh, the the idea that you in most cases or in many cases uh, may need uh, to call reserve. This, this uh, is the one I'm thinking of. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and what you say is that, well, reserve might be optimizing, but in some cases might be pessimizing. That's right, because it's um, famously difficult to, to keep these things in sync, either because of off by one errors or just because of code evolving. So if you look at this code and say, oh, I'll just reserve a thousand um, items in the vector up front. Um, that, that's fine if you've read the loop correctly. But let, let's say you accidentally reserved one less than you, you should have done. Then it's going to push back into the vector all the way up to, say, 999. And then it's going to push back one more, and it's going to allocate twice as much memory as you actually needed. So that, that's, that's the danger to that. Whereas if you let it do its typical doubling as you went through, you'll probably get to 1,024, you know, boost over. And obviously, there, you know, sometimes it might work the other way. Sometimes you'd end up with... A, a big yeah i agree um, extra allocation the, the point is it's not so clear cut it's not I necessarily agree. as much of so, an optimization as it sometimes seems so let's scroll to the next one so here we go oh uh here um yeah this one i i guess you know it's it's quite a corner uh, i wouldn't wouldn't expect the tools to find this one I mean, uh, here we uh, create a vector with a size which is zero initialized, and then uh, pro probably mm -hmm. the programmer didn't know, and then he, uh, she or he is running a loop in order to initialize all to the zero, which is redundant. So th this one I actually felt in the end, um, maybe we should warn on. So again, I'm, I'm raising a ticket on that internally. But by the way, um, we're, <laughs> we're looking at some of these that SoloLint doesn't catch. And I'm saying I'm raising a ticket because I, I want to emphasize that. Yeah, if you find things that you think your tool should warn you on, you know, do, do let us know. And we do listen. We'll cons consider all these angles. And sometimes there is, like we've, we've looked at, that there's a reason why mm -hmm. we shouldn't do it after all. And sometimes it's just, yeah, we haven't got to that yet. Uh, in right. this case, with an integer, there's not really that much in it. Um, it it's not that, that big a deal. But if it wasn't an integer, if it's a more complex type with a copy constructor that's doing some work, then yeah, but you're basically in initializing and then assigning. You know, that, Which is quite uh, similar to the first example. That um, having, a, having a size yeah. and then uh, overriding all items. Yes, yes. So it could, yeah, it could be the same thing there. Yeah. Uh, and, and as I say, we, we should warn on that as well. So yeah. I'm, I'm inclined to actually warn on that. Obviously, if you're assigning... Um, yeah, if you're assigning the same value every time, you're probably better off doing that in the constructor mm. anyway. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's th there's two ways we, you can look at that. Okay. Um, so, so let's yeah, go on and, and, and mm -hmm. let's take a look on and other things. Yeah. There was so, a, there was a um, um, comment in the chat that maybe the compiler can omit this code. So maybe we have uh, compiler optimizations that are smart enough. I think yeah. that I checked that uh, even with minus 02 and minus 03, and, and mm -hmm. uh, it depends, but I think uh, it doesn't. Yeah, and funnily enough, in the, the talk we talked about earlier, uh, Zen and the Art of Code Lifecycle Maintenance, I have a very similar example. It's not, in, not with a vector, but just with um, just the, the basic idea of uh, initializing rather than assigning. Um, doing something in a more functional style, which will result in expressions that can initialize rather than having to rely on side effects to, to assign after the event. If you've got something slightly more complex there, even if it's all in the same scope, surprisingly, most compilers are not able to optimize that away and actually show you the god bolt that, um, mm -hmm. that, that bears that out. So yeah, um, right. it's, it's a very real issue. Okay, so let's take the next one, which I would say mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, it's a blunt uh, bug. Yes, and I was quite surprised that we, we didn't already catch this one. <laughs> so <laughs> I've definitely raised uh, an issue on, on this. And uh, okay, a colleague of mine is, is picking that up. Okay, so we would not take that uh, into the IDE. Uh, you mm -hmm. just remember to follow that one. 
yeah. Okay. Um, say that, I mean, it is, a, it is a, almost a corner case where we, we know all these values up front. We know there's only one element, and then we know that we're going beyond the end um, within a limited scope. But usually these problems crop up when the connection between those two things is, is not really knowable, at least at compile time. So even though we should, I, we should catch it when we can, though. Yeah, even though I do remember that you have good examples that I hope that we would see later on, on deep analysis, which means that, yeah, it's not in the same scope, but we do, uh, we are able to analyze yeah. the, um, the flow in a way uh, and, and understand what yeah. happens there. So if we can catch it compile time or uh, static analysis time, we should. My point here is more that for these sort of things, we should definitely be relying on uh, dynamic analysis. And you've even mentioned that in your post. Mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah. that, that, that's why that you need both is yeah, the point i agree so uh next one yeah uh next one i would skip i would skip it's it's something that relates yeah. to efficiency and and you know it's it's more mm -hmm. for the programmer but i would say that this one is is interesting uh, and and you know it is yeah yeah invalidating using an invalidated uh iterator while looping on the vector it, it sounds like it should definitely be you know a, bit, a big no no uh, we, we don't currently warn on this. Um, I I have raised it to, after seeing this so that we can discuss it internally. But there is a, a flip side, which is if you have reserved space ahead of time, then that pushback may actually be okay. It's still a bit of a code smell. It's a bit of a yeah. Bit it's of a, a dangerous smell. thing it's to do. Either, it's either a code yeah. smell or a bug. It, it's it's just that it's not necessarily. I mean, it is in this case, but it's not necessarily a bug in the general case. So. It does, does, does color the way that we approach these things. Okay. But we, we try to go for the more clear cut ones uh, first where, where possible. Okay. But um, I, I've raised it anyway. Um, do we have some more here? There's the, the memory leak. Well, the, the, yeah, this was an interesting one as well because we will catch a leak if you've, if you've used new and assign it directly to a pointer. But we don't catch the leak. What we do is we say, you know, you should be using at least unique pointer here or, or some mm -hmm. of uh, you know memory managed smart pointer uh, and that that would then eliminate the the leak or the potential for the leak because again in this case maybe it's obvious directly in the scope in the more general case you'd need to rely on dynamic analysis to catch it but you can use the type system to to address this and that's really what the warning should say unfortunately <laughs> that that rule gets um disabled if the result of new is passed to a function, hmm. which it is, it is here, because the assumption is if you're passing it to a function, it's quite likely that that function is taking ownership, or at least we can't prove one way or the other. So, And, and the idea, should, I guess, yeah. is to avoid uh, false positives. It is, yeah. And that is the perennial pro problem with um, static analysis, is you can never completely eliminate false positives. Uh, well, there is what there's only one way to elim completely eliminate all false positives and that's to give, to also to give no uh, warning at all absolutely to eliminate all true positives as well okay. so okay. it's always going to be a balance and in this particular instance you know we decided that, that that's where the balance the best balance is yeah if you're passing it to a function then you're going to get too many false positives from transfer of ownership situations which are quite legitimate um but it means that there's a uh, a uh, loophole here where, where we can have an obvious, seemingly obvious leak uh, that we don't catch. But what we've decided since looking at this is we could make an exception for any of the standard containers. If you're passing it to a standard container for, for storage, well, we know that they're not actually managing that memory for you. So we, we should warn about it. So I'm raising a ticket on that basis. Okay. So, Based, this on, based really on the useful. lifetime, I guess, based on the lifetime of the container, because it might be that at a certain other point, somebody loops on the container and evacuates and, and deletes all the yeah. uh, allocations. Good. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the next one is something uh, uh, that, that we can take into the ID. I, I remember yeah. that we discussed that, and there is something mm -hmm. interesting on that. So maybe we can copy that, copy that yeah, to the ID. Um, by the way, I think that we have to ask the audience and maybe Phil ask you as well, whether it would be fine to overrun a bit. Uh, I think that we would need some more time 
Uh, and I, I want to have more examples between, which means that we would um, take more time than planned. I would ask my admin here as well. Is it fine? Can we do that? Yeah, yeah you got a yes here. Phil, is it okay with you as well? It's, it's okay for me. Okay. Uh, I think we, we've run a bit too long on some of our sides, so sorry about that. Oh, it's fine. But, but um, yeah, we, we uh, still have a lot of examples that we want to cover. So I'm trying to copy this in as quickly as possible without losing too much of the dynamic nature. So if I remember rightly, this is the essential of, of what we Yeah, and we, we want to add derived factors. classes as well. But, yeah, and, and then and, we're saying if we add a, a destructor to that, I can't type today, that clears the clears that vector. Yeah, by the way, we can stop here and ask the audience uh, in the chat, what is the issue? What is the problem here? Yep, so I won't, I won't go to the highlight there. No. Yeah, the first one you uh, would say uh, um, the problem, uh, there are no prices today, but would earn, you know, the glory. <laughs> uh, any answer in the chat of what is the problem? Uh, virtual destructor. Well, um, there isn't any inheritance here, so I would not go with virtual destructor unless we need that. And here, I, I don't. I, I'm not sure that we need. So this is why we do not have virtual destructor. But there is another issue here. Uh, we have a vector at line 22. Uh, shape store might travel around, might be passed around, and if we pass around shape store, and we have here a uh, destructor at line 24. It means that we waived something, which we do not want to waive. We actually want it. Uh, no, uh, yeah, we are clearing shape twice, but you know, the second time that we clear it, it's empty. So it's not so it's expensive. Yeah. Uh, the problem is that once we have a destructor, then we are not in the rule of zero, mm -hmm. uh, which means that yes. we um, just lost the default move operations. And here it is quite costly because we have a vector inside. And I was very happy to see, Phil, that Sonolint mm -hmm. has a very nice warning here. Which it seems to have cut off a bit. Let me see if I can <laughs> make my share yeah, screen so, a bit so, so the idea is that, yeah, you, uh, and, and does, uh, uh, does Clunk Tidy say something about that here? Or only, this, or only Sonar? Sonolint? No, uh, Sonolint says that we should remove the destructor so the class follows the rule of zero. So that's your point. Yeah. Um, and uh, in case we have something or, in the destructor, we need to or think go about the other it. Way. So that there's this interplay between the rule of zero and the rule of five. Then if you, if you supply one of them or one or two of them, you should probably at least consider all five. Um, otherwise, try to go the other way and supply none. Okay. Because... Yeah, and, if, and if you've got something custom going on and you really need to do it, you need to supply all five and then you're opting out of some of the optimizations. But to get all those optimizations, you need to be following the rule of zero. So always do that when you can. And the tool can show you the explanation, I think. So uh, maybe we can... Yes, yeah, so let's... Um, I haven't really looked at it yet, have we? But um, we can say... Oh, I don't know what it is now. This one, yeah. So if we say show the rule description, most of these rules have these really in-depth uh, discussions of, of why this, this might be an issue. So yeah. this one, you know, most classes should not directly handle resources. That's the thing is Vexa does handle the resources for you. That's why we don't need to do dot clear here. That, that's why we would be clearing it twice. So if we just let Vexa do its job, then we don't have anything to manage. And so we shouldn't add anything to that. And then we're back um, to the rule of zero. Yep, omitting all these functions from a class is known as the rule of zero. Um, and then I, does it tell you, I forget now, if it tells you why that's uh, an example, that uh, just gives some exceptions. But, um, it does point out that writing them is, is typically tricky and error prone. Okay. Which it I, is. I think that we would go now to other examples. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, maybe we would uh, drop a poll uh, in between. Yes. So um, Yuval here, my admin, is uh, 
sending a poll to the audience. And then while the poll is out there, we can, I think, go to our next set of examples. Um, and I uh, also uh, send the audience to follow in the chat. We have the, also the link to the vector pitfalls uh, blog post, if you want to go through the examples. Uh, the question in the poll is, are you using uh, static code analysis tools? And I can tell you that currently most of the audience are answering yes. Maybe this is why they came to the, this webinar. To, maybe they wanted to yeah. hear the answer to, is it worth it? Uh, mm -hmm. In order to make sure that they are using it and, and it does worth it. Yes, yeah, so oh. the question I really want answered or responded to by, by the audience is, are there any reasons that you're not using such oh, a th that's, that's a good question. And, and, and as, as you raised, uh, it is free. So both uh, Clunk Tidy and both uh, Sonar Lint that can mm -hmm. be uh, deployed, can be used inside C-Lion and other tools. Uh, yeah. So, and, and there are other, um, you know, other tools that you can put on top of that, but uh, start yeah. with the basics, start with finding actual bugs. Uh, let's take a few more examples. I, have, I must have them. Uh, we spoke about our values and move semantics mm -hmm. and temporary yes. and folding reference. Let's, you know, drop them all into uh, some examples. So I've got some good prepared examples for move semantics. So I'm going to um, mostly paste these in because it's going to save a lot of time. So let's get a couple of um, couple of types to work with, first of all. So we've got a uh, just a, a normal class here that um, just has default constructors move. You can move it, you can copy it. Um, yeah, technically this is not following the rule of zero, but that's just to, uh, to make that mm -hmm. obvious. Whereas this one, we are specifically not making this copyable, uh, sorry, not making it movable, but it is yes. copyable. So it's literally an immovable object. So let's now also drop in some functions that can take some of these types. So F takes them by uh, value. G takes the movable and copyable one by const ref. So now we get to answer the question. What happens when an unstoppable force puts an immovable object? So uh, yeah, let's just declare a couple of instances as well. So we've got some of those. Now, if we call some of these functions and use std move. So std move, of course, famously does not move. <laughs> All it does is make sure that whatever you pass it, um, which is of course an, R, R, an L value, becomes an R value. So an R value, for those that are not so clear on it, is is basically something that's not named or nameable. So often like the, the left hand side, uh, the right hand side of, a, of an expression. Um, which means because it's not named by anything, no one else can refer to it. So it's actually safe to move from it. Um, and, and that's fine in that case, because this object is movable mm -hmm. and we're passing it to someone which takes it by value. Okay. What about if we try to move the one that's not movable? And then we get our highlight. So, yep, clang tie defines it. Result of moving std move as a const reference argument. No move will actually happen. Um, and then sonar lint um, is not telling me what it normally tells me, actually. There we are. That, that's what it should be telling us. The result of std move should not be passed as a const reference. But there's there's two, like from both sides of it. Mm -hmm. We so have to see the results of the poll, I think. At least I see oh, it, yeah. right? Uh, mm -hmm. So um, yeah, 82% do use and find it beneficial. Um, well done, everyone. <laughs> and, and, and the rest, almost all the rest uh, do not use, but uh, they say that they should. So that's good. Yeah. 
uh, I'm closing that and, and getting back to the example. So in this example, we see that uh, both Sonar and Clang Tidy uh, are able to say that uh, the move is not actually moving here. I want to add something here. Can we add uh, at line uh, between 27 and 28, at line 27 and a half, um, something with uf.data? Let's, let's approach UF. Uh, UF is the one that is actually moved at line 26. UF and UF as a data. Um, uh, and, let's, so, yeah. and let's write into data at index zero something. I mean, we are approaching something that was moved. I'm just, you know, tackling you to see, ooh, would you see here? Uh, yeah. um, would we have here an actual issue? So we approach so, UF data, uh, not in order to, uh, uh, we can override it, but uh, I, yeah. I, uh, I think of uh, approaching an index. So you have dot data at index zero, uh, which, you know, data is invalidated right now. Yeah, if we, if we did that, I would- Equals, equals I would, uh, it's a vector of integers or strings. Uh, it was a vector of integers. Okay, let's put there the 42, the famous 42. Okay. Okay, now I would expect that to be, well, that, that's going to be undefined behavior. Yeah, that's good. But on, the, the on question is counts. what, what uh, our linters say. Yeah. Uh, method called um, and moved from. Yeah, yeah. This is one of the most important things, I would say, because yeah. the fear of using something that we moved from can be eliminated in a way uh, if we say, don't worry, mm -hmm. uh, don't do that. But if accidentally you are doing that, there is somebody there watching for you. It's important. Yes, yes. No, it's, it's good for these tools to have your back, but you know, it, when everything's all in the same function, it's fine. As things yeah. get more complicated, we, we can't always catch it, so don't rely on it. <laughs> sure, for sure. But but uh, I would say that the move uh, uh, issues are usually in such cases. Can it catch us uh, if we forget to use move? So suppose we are in the uh, move constructor. Let's go to the move constructor and get something that should be moved. Like instead of doing default, let's implement the move constructor by passing the vector to the other vector. So we got a vector inside unstoppable force and we forward it uh, or we, we try to pass it to our internal data. So uh, I, I would say in line I eight, the colon would go to data should get other data. And we forget to call std move. And sorry for tackling you, I, I hope that we would find something okay. interesting here. Yeah, so th this is completely, not just unscripted, but unprepared. <laughs> so let's see what it says here. Um, yeah. Oh, well, we see so, it from Clunk Tidy, and we see it also from... So suddenly it's telling us that um, it should be exception free. Oh, let's add no accept. That's that's also very important. Mm -hmm. Not to not uh, you should not forget the no accept. Otherwise, if we are using a vector of unstoppable force uh, um, object, then we lose the move on the elements of the vector. Uh, the only, no accept probably would go uh, right after the arguments. Yeah, that's here. what I thought. It didn't seem to like. No that. x. We are missing a c after the x. Inside the no except, no x, the c after the x, uh, right before the b. No, no, I did not expect. Yeah. No except. Uh, the, this is live coding. So definitely live coding. <laughs> okay. All right. So now, now what's it saying? Okay. So only clang tidy. I, I think this um, is something that you are, uh, you know, we spoke before, and and mm -hmm. we know that in some cases uh, we want to tell people. Use all tools that you have attended. Yes. So yeah. uh, in some cases, uh, Sonolint would say something that Clang Tidy doesn't say. In some mm -hmm. cases, Clang Tidy would say something that uh, you have both. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, we, we do um, periodically look at Clang Tidy, see what new rules it's introduced. And if we find them useful, we'll adopt them as well um, or, or re-implement them, sometimes with variations. Um, but we don't do that all the time, so that sometimes a little bit ahead on, on something. So definitely use both. If you're using C-Line, it's basically already built in, so you're good. Okay. We had, I think that we had other examples that we uh, spoke about, uh, we thought about regarding uh, move semantics. Uh, we mm -hmm. had something nice about forwarding reference. Maybe yes. you want to raise that? And, yeah, and me, um... again, I'm, I'm uh, noting to the audience, 
uh, Phil and I just discussed that and we would overrun. Uh, uh, so we would uh, use some more time. Anybody who had, uh, we need to go, we are recording that and would share the link to the webinar later on. But we have some more examples to explore. So if you have the time, if you can stay with us. This is quite a good one, I think, because it's it's the sort of thing that catches people, like even experts, so often. De definitely, I've been caught out by this. But oh, so we can ask so, the audience, what is the problem with line thirty-seven? Oh, um, no, that, that's oh, not the that's not the issue. Not so have an this is a setup issue. Okay, okay so we, we just got this base class here just to um, just to set us up. So, uh, so uh, uh, maybe we can check why it is yellow over there at line thirty-seven. I'm curious. So I think that's just because, yeah, we're not actually doing anything anything oh, with argument. yeah but, okay. but that, that's the purpose of this is to give us somewhere to move this into so um in this example i think that we I... can just in in the previous one we can just you know uh remove the name of the argument and then maybe uh sona would be happy with us uh no they're just... not complaining again you haven't given it a name oh yeah okay <laughs> okay uh no that, that's okay that's um it's not really important to know what's there but it is important to know why this is going wrong. So we've got, um, we've got this argument coming in here. It looks like a, an R value reference because it's got double ampersand. So we're but trying just to move it. It's not, no, what, what yeah. is it? Uh, I think the audience know that it is a, a, a forwarding reference. Yes. And then I would because ask you, uh, I don't know if we practiced that uh, before or not, uh, if this, uh, 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 if if we can move line 42 to be above the class itself, then would we, and then it would become mm -hmm. our value reference, then would the warning disappear? Exactly. So, yeah, there we go. That's nice. Yeah. So it actually uh, realizes whether the uh, double ampersand is an R value or a forwarding reference. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which, which, is looking... not, which is not so, uh, oh, I, I want to, to try another one. I want to try another mm -hmm. one. If you can uh, get the template back into uh, the class above the function and maybe let's add a const to, oh, we cannot move from a const so we would have another, uh, maybe something else. I know, I know. Let's get, instead of a T, let's get a vector of T. Stood vector of T as an R value, uh, I mean as two, as double ampersand, which means that here the double ampersand are on something which is not the template parameter itself, which means that, well, uh, it is an R value. And mm -hmm. do we get any warning here now? No. It means that the tool is working. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. that's good. Bravo. Yeah. And we have I a Bravo here. Back. Bravo. <laughs> If I put it back to that, this is one of the ones that has a quick fix. We'll change it to forward oh, for you. That's even... Is, yeah, not that hard to do it yourself. But it's yeah, nice. but it's planned. It. I, I, I would yeah. tell you that it is not hard, but in many cases, I just forget to put the T in the rectangle brackets, and then it takes another minute to say, oh, yeah, I forgot the yeah. T in the rectangle brackets, uh, triangle brackets, sorry. Uh, yeah, that's very nice. Uh, let's go to another one, another example. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, to the audience, we are overrunning, I know, and it is recorded. So if you have to go, we would share the link to the recording. I want to pass a shared PTR. Um, oh, yes. A shared PTR by ref and sending to a thread. Because I know this is uh, something that I just, you know, I met as a bug. Um, so suppose that we have a shared pointer and we passed the shell pointer by ref, which is controversial to begin with, but not only that, we pass it into another thread. So eventually it means that, well, we do not increase the reference counter and the other thread is sharing the same shell PTR, which is not the right way to use a shell PTR. So by ref, you say, so using std ref. Yes, because if we want to pass something by ref to a thread, then uh, we can use jthread maybe. We are with uh, C20 here. Yep. Yeah. With the proper using or the proper, what's the problem here? Oh, we are not with C20 here in this project? Uh, maybe I didn't. No, there should be, yeah. Uh, there was a question in the chat why uh, the class A itself, we see yellow on the 
uh, on the name of the class A. Because it's not used. Were missing the, oh, the, um, the, you, oh, because there is a constructor which is not being used. Sure. Yeah. Okay, That's so uh, what's wrong with our J thread? It's still not open. Well, yeah, it, we'll it shouldn't matter, thread, for, the, we, we shouldn't matter for the case of that. So. Yeah. Except that this is next to the J thread. <laughs> we can ignore that for now. Um, yeah, I did, I did include thread. Yeah, yeah, we, we include thread, uh, something in the configuration. Oh, no, I know, I know, I know where it is. Um, let's very quickly do this. Sorry, I know we're already over time, but by default, it's using my Apple Clang version, but I can uh, switch that to GCC 11. That should. Okay, and, and now we have uh, an issue with our short PTR, maybe. Uh, yeah. Transitive includes. Okay. We'll get there in the end. NT is not being used? Uh, it shouldn't be red underline. Static, let's say. Red agreements must be invocable. Ah, because I didn't, um, I didn't give oh. it a. The function, the call. function that we want to call. Yeah. We want to call F1 yeah. and we want F1. Uh, we, we can do the, oh, we can do a recursive call, just, you know, okay. if we want. So that's But then F1 take... should get a uh, short PTR. Uh, we can even send the same shared PTR. You know, uh, the recursive is not the issue here, but to check whether if we send the short PTR by ref and we pass it on, and then we can, you know, remove it here. And the question is, because I, I, this bothers me, because in a way, you know, this is one of the points where rasters would say, well, in Rust, you cannot share something, uh, you know, unsafely yes. between threads. And, and here I would expect a static code analysis tool to point me at your sharing a shared PTR between threads. Yes. And it doesn't. So it, it doesn't. And I had a conversation with a, with a colleague about this. And our conclusion was that if you're, if you're going as far as using std ref, then we, we sort of hope that you know what you're doing, that you're you're direct, you're deliberately opting in to saying, okay, I know I've got a shared pointer, it's got its own ownership semantics, but I want to stood ref this, so I want to make sure it's passed by reference, um, even though we can't easily express that otherwise. So it's the same I argument. I would say that this is the same argument for any bug. Uh, a, a bug is something that, well, the user asked for it. Yeah, but uh, we are the grown ups here to say you ask for it, no, but you know, it's buggy. M m most bugs, you, um, you sort of ch choose the, um, the path of least resistance. Because if, if I. If I Maybe it's a off, question to the, to the audience. Uh, what do you would, think? What do you think? Uh, uh, should there be a yeah. rule for pointing up uh, uh, on. on um, on, we have here a shared reference, a shared PTR that we pass by reference to a thread. Uh, do you think that this should be something that the static analysis tools uh, would warn on or not? Now, yeah, we, we can pass it. If we remove the ref, then it doesn't compile and that's fine. But the bug here is that for some reason, first, Line 48, somebody created a design, an API that gets shared PTR by ref. Many people would say that this is the bug. Others would say, no, this is not the bug unless you actually call it as a thread and pass actually uh, shared PTR by ref. And then this is the bug. So I say, okay, it is either this one or the other, but line 50 is buggy. I, I see something bad in line 50. What do you say? I, I mean, is it something that you want your static analysis tool to warn uh, about or not? Any idea from uh, the audience? I think that uh, some of the audience had to go. We are overrunning uh, time yes. because it's, you know, it's an interesting topic. Um, uh, there is a suggestion to open a poll mm -hmm. on that. Um, I think that we would pass the poll because I want to go to another example if you may, uh, let's try another one. I have Should in mind- make this the last one then? Okay, yeah. We would uh, make the next one the last one. And recently I just, um, you know, uh, went into a bug. I was 
for an example, um, implementing a variadic max. And I discussed oh, yes. that with you, so you have the code and we can go to the code and, and see that. And the issue is that once I have a variadic max and I send to it uh, both. Let me, let me place the code in so we can. Yeah, we can see and, and then the audience can, can follow and, and uh, see what uh, the problem that we have. So we have here, we... yeah, I, I would try to explain the code and, and let's see if, okay. if you uh, are um, with me or you agree with my explanation. Um, so we have uh, the my max for two and we have the my max for um, variadic pack. And uh, we call from the variadic pack with uh, uh, the stop condition going to the first one, uh, like the very, gen uh, very known recursion uh, on variadic pack. And the issue here is that if we call max with three items and the three items are a string and two child star, the problem is, can you see the problem? I ran it with two compilers and got two different results. Uh, on one compiler, the max was welcome, and on another one, it was buy. The question is why? Uh, no, we can call it with three parameters. It, it compiles, it runs, and, and it returns either I or welcome or buy. It compiles because, well, we have the variadic pack version on line 63. The, it is a variadic template. We can call it with any number of uh, variables, I, I think including and, one. And any number of types. And any number of types, that's correct. And, and then when we call it with a string and two char stars, uh, we have an issue. And the issue is that we compare at the end two char stars. So the welcome, uh, sorry, the high, the high is being compared with welcome. This is fine. Welcome would be converted into a string and we are on, in the safe zone. But then, mm -hmm. The result is welcome, by the way. Then we take the welcome and we compare it with buy, and there we have an issue. I think maybe it's first this one, first welcome and buy, and then we have an issue. Anyhow, welcome and buy are addresses. So we compare mm -hmm. addresses. And, and the question, I raised the question to Phil, and Phil said, yes, uh, let's, let's check it. And and you see that stop using pointers to different arrays. Yeah, no, no cool. that's the nice. Pointers is the important word. That's nice because it's a, it's a templated function. So, so uh, Sonar is being able here uh, to point us at an issue uh, which is being done only with certain call. Um, if we change, uh, can, can we add S to welcome and to buy and see that you know the problem disappears? I mean, S as B, uh, uh, the string literal. We have got the string literals. Oh, we have, we have string literals right above. We only need one actually, don't we? Yeah, yeah there we go. one is enough and, and it's gone. Mm -hmm. Because now we are not uh, comparing addresses and that's nice. And I did see uh, an actual bug. This was my bug. I mean, I just implemented that and some, then something uh, you know strange came out and then I just saw it and I, I said, okay, I have to share that with Phil. Uh, but I had another bug that a student of mine came in and asked, why I'm getting this strange result? Let's have this one as the last one. Uh, Phil, so the last one would be, <laughs> I have a char okay. star string, and I want to concatenate a char to it. So in order to concatenate a char to it, I just add the char with a plus sign. So I have a char star um, uh, um, string. Um, it, would air old something, maybe we need to have it as a const, um, const our star, uh, yeah. And um, we want another string to add, let's say uh, the char exclamation mark. So uh, another something or auto, we can call it uh, auto something or auto new or auto something new, something else is good. Uh, and let's add exclamation mark. As a character. And, yeah, and, and that's an actual bug that um, I'm teaching C++ and a student of mine came with something like that. And, and you know, eventually it's not, you are not getting uh, uh, something with exclamation mark, you are getting another mm -hmm. address, which might be yeah. within the address, uh, within the boundaries of the same string or not. And we do see that we have here, uh, do we have a static analysis warning? 
We do. We Adding do. char to a string pointer does not append to the string. Now this warning is coming from C line, not even claim tidy, but just C line itself. So Sona Lint's not picking up on this one, and it's another one that I've raised. So okay. thanks for that. Okay. So so this is something that uh, also shows that in some cases uh, the IDE itself would say something and listen to your IDE because it has mm -hmm. internal uh, linter of its own. Yeah. yeah. I think that we are about to conclude, but uh, before concluding, um, maybe, you know, a few few points to, to, uh, to summarize. Uh, we saw Clunk Tidy is doing a good job. We saw Sonar Lint, uh, Sonar Source uh, is doing, doing a very good job in, in many cases. Um, but I think that we also saw that um, it is still the programmer responsibility to have code reviews, to make sure that uh, things are, um, are going right. Uh, I mean, you cannot skip code reviews. No, and uh, yeah, static analysis you can think of as just automating part of the code review, but it doesn't completely replace them. Right, and, and on the other end, it, it would catch many issues that I would say I, I wouldn't see. I, I, I mean, this one that we just, uh, um, you know, presented, the max thing, mm -hmm. um, you know, at the beginning, something strange came out and it took me a few minutes to, oh yeah, I see the problem. But yeah. when you see the issue with static analysis, you know, you uh, spare a lot of time and in many cases, or in some cases you would spare actual production bugs. Uh, so uh, Phil, thank you very much. It was an excellent thank discussion. You. I feel that we need to, uh, meet again for some, uh, you know, because we had many other more examples yeah. that we know need to go through. Um, we recorded the entire session. So uh, anybody who wants to go through that, uh, we will share the link. Um, I think that um, we can thank you all. And again, uh, huge thanks to you, Phil. Uh, we, look, we look forward to seeing uh, you, the audience, with uh, our next events. Thank you very much. Thank you. And shout out to Victoria in the chat from the PBS, PBS yes, um, I was saying PBS, yes, PBS Studio, one of our competitors, but we're all friendly. Oh, yeah. So uh, you, you get friendly uh, messages over there. And, and we would uh, um, get uh, the questions that uh, were not answered and maybe some of them we can answer back and you know we would put it uh, in our blog or in uh, LinkedIn. Uh, I would ask uh, anybody who has a question after this session, uh, you can share it with us uh, by email. You can send an email to marketing at incredibuild.com. Uh, you can see the email in the chat in a moment. Um, and these questions would go either directly to Phil or uh, maybe if some of the questions uh, are related to us, we would be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Phil, and thank you, you, the audience, for bearing with us. See you in our next event. Thank you. Bye all.